Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Colin Bailey, the newly appointed director of the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco, which is comprised of the De Young and the California Legion of Honor. Colin has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Colin, for joining us today. I'm very happy to be here. Now, you are coming from a completely different coast, a completely different city, New York City, and a completely different museum, the Frick. Talk about the Frick first, and tell me a, a little bit about how that museum is situated in the constellation of museums in New York. Well, the, the Frick has enormous affection as a jewel in New York's crown. It is a small house museum created in 1915 by Henry Clay Frick, always meant to be given to the public, a collection of masterworks of European art, expanding over time, growing, continuing to grow, but perceived perhaps as rather a closed, quiet, self-reliant institution. And the pleasure that I've had over the last 15 years, both seeing it and then working in it, is that the collections their quality is so extraordinary that we have been able to add in our exhibition program, our education program, and to really interact with the city and beyond. The Frick has always had a mission that's been quite clear. It is devoted to works of art of the highest quality and making them accessible and allowing people to enter them. And that mission, I think, is a mission that is appropriate absolutely for the job that, I, that I'm taking on. What a, a, an amazing place to come from to take this position at the Fine Arts Museums with its ambition to really open itself uh, further to the world of art and the world of exhibition. Well, when, when I was chairing the uh, National Endowment's indemnity panel for ensuring exhibitions, I did that for three years, and I was amazed every meeting San Francisco had the most ambitious projects, and the mo I, was, I was always wondering, how is it they've got Picasso? How is it they're doing music at the Musée d'Orsay show? How is it they have these, these shows? And as someone who had also worked on a larger arena earlier in my career, and who had, at the Frick, was now focusing on rather smaller but very prestigious exhibitions, which we shared with the Louvre, or we shared with the National Gallery of Canada, and with the Fine Arts, and with the Fine Arts Museum at the moment, with, with our show that you have now, and that we, we will have at the Frick, and um, the, the Vermeer show. I was very impressed with this energy, and really didn't un quite understand how this had happened, but could see it, that it had happened. And so for me, when this became a possibility to come to San Francisco, I felt that I could take some of the connections and relationships that I have and a belief that an exhibition program that's dynamic, serious, varied, and has opportunities for in increasing scholarship, increasing awareness, that I would have a platform here that would be like at the Met or, or the National Gallery of, of, of Art in Washington or Chicago. And what a thrill that is for me. I also want to say that the collections at the Legion the collections that, that I'm most familiar with, the European collections, the works on paper, are very distinguished. And in a way, when you, go to, when you look at any major show of Rembrandt or Tiepolo or Manet, Georges de la Tour, uh, the Fine Arts Museum is, is always a lender. And so one of the things that excites me is perhaps to make the Fine Arts Museum also a participant in organizing and in sharing some of these shows that we generate, as it were, from the ground up. And I must say that the new museum, the de Young, which I had been hearing about and had, everyone was so enthusiastic about, when I came uh, to see it, it's, it, it, it is so beautifully rendered and it is so beautifully working now. When you step in, you feel that you're welcomed, the space is, is appropriate, warm, and the galleries are, are all are, are different. The American galleries are superbly classical, and then you can go to the exhibition galleries downstairs, which are immense and really fashioned so well. So I'm, I can't tell you how exciting an opportunity it is. The de Young in particular, as, as a contrast to the Legion, is such a masterwork in strategy. It, it provides in one institution both the contemporary and the classical architectural reference points. Um, how the art can be exhibited is so diverse. You can have small, uh, very intimate spaces or very large uh, public spaces. It, it becomes an, a, an amazing canvas. Well, Mark, you feel that when you go upstairs and you look at some of the 
uh, African art and the oceanic art, the rooms are so, in a way, intimate and effective for these works that need lower lighting and they need to be displayed obviously differently from um, the American paintings. And then the textiles collection, which is one of the great greatest in the country, this too has a, a place there. And I w I'm excited to, to get to learn these collections because it's really for me a huge learning curve that's ahead. This museum has gone through many stages and since the Loma Prieta earthquake where the uh, de Young was damaged, uh, to the opening of the new de Young, um, the, uh, the challenge of creating Embrace, which John Buchanan really did so uh, magnificently. He was, he was a fine, fine uh, director to launch and relaunch this. Harry Parker before him, um, having uh, built the museums and, and seen those projects through. Now is the time, now is the time to create that Embrace on the, on the art side that, that uh, would fulfill the ambition of the community. Well, it's, it seems to me that the community is so engaged in the museums. In a way, the, the Young and the Legion are the Met, MoMA, uh, the Frick, all in one. And to, to, to be able to have this menu of possibilities, I, I'm, I'm very excited also because this is a city that has superb universities who have important art history faculties, history faculties, and getting them engaged, getting some of the scholarship that is being created here, working with cu curators to see where new avenues might exist for us. The place of the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco and how that fits in is going to be, it's going to be very interesting for you as you navigate that and navigate that in the new city. And in a way, in New York, even if we're small at the Frick, you're engaged in a lot of discussions and you partake of some of the new ideas in outreach, in audience development, in membership, in cultivation. Um, the Frick has done more of that than maybe is understood and this imp the importance of, of maintaining, creating and maintaining relationships at so many different levels from collectors and donors and art lovers to the city, the schools, the public officials, to the general public. What, what, what so excited me about the, on the visits I've made to San Francisco is how welcomed you feel when you step into the de Young or the Legion. And, and that sense of a, of, of a home, of a, of a place, is regardless of size, is very important. And it was thrilling to me to see that there's already such warmth and uh, enthusiasm for the audience. So, for me, um, I mean, it's a, it's, it will be a chance to get to learn these collections, to get to learn the curators, conservators, educators, staff, to get to learn the public. But it, I'm, I'm energetic, but it, will, it does take some time. What was interesting to me, learning about you, is tracing your trajectory. You were also educated at the Sorbonne. I had a year as a, I did, I had a year as um, a Sorbonne, Oxford Sorbonne Fellow. I lived in Paris for nearly four years when I was doing doctoral work. I've always worked on French art as well as other things, but French art is my first love, 18th and 19th century, and I feel very privileged that I've had a chance to really know those collections and the colleagues in the Louvre and the Musée d'Orsay. Um, it's been, I mean, it's very much part of what I am in, in terms of my, uh, as an art historian, as a curator. And you started off your curatorial uh, career, I believe, in Philadelphia, the Philadelphia Museum of Art. You went on to uh, be the senior curator at the uh, Kimball Art Museum. You were with the National Gallery of Canada uh, before joining the Frick. Uh, talk about these different experiences and the roles that, that um, that those experience had in your own professional development? I started out as a student studying art history thinking I would become a, an academic. And in the 70s in England there were no internships, no fellowships, and I was offered one at the Getty in California. I think of my career beginning when I had a year at the old Getty in, in LA. And that opened up the possibilities of a museum to me and I realized that was where I wanted to work. So you didn't want to be writing uh, simply and teaching and, and being in a school and being in your office and, and... It was the contact with objects and it was the opportunity to speak in front of objects to a variety of audiences and getting people engaged and learning oneself about pictures, sculptures, furniture that 
you'd read and you'd read about, but you hadn't actually seen as works that are created and how they're created. That experience at the Getty really made me feel that this was the path I would like to take. And I was extremely lucky because at the Getty, I met my future boss who was visiting, and it took a year and a half, but found a, a, an assistant's position for me, an assistant curator in Philadelphia. And the Philadelphia Museum of Art, rather like the Fine Arts Museum, an encyclopedic collection it's with wonderful. extraordinary depth in, in so many areas, and a very compassionate staff. And I was there, for, and it was my training for four years. Um, I worked on a number of projects, but I, I knew that if I wanted to gain more experience, I'd have to leave. And then the opportunity to work in Fort Worth, Texas at the Kimball. So I've been lucky to work in extraordinary buildings as well. Uh, you're taking quite a tour by this time of your career of uh, American uh, cultural distinctions and, and different cities. I did, and I then went to Canada for six years at the National Gallery of Canada, where I was sent around to almost every community that had an interest in art, um, really in a way that you, you acted as a spokesman. And I found, uh, I found that exciting. I met artists, I met art lovers and people who ran institutions. I was very privileged that the government funding in the National Gallery was extraordinary. And some of the curators weren't aware of how lucky and extraordinary the situation was. And so we then became more ambitious in our programming. We, we, did, we did things like borrow Picassos from MoMA, borrow masterworks of Impressionism from Boston. We all organized major exhibitions, Renoir's portraits with Chicago. Very proud of these things and this balance of programming um, really, really was very fulfilling. And in a way, going to the Frick was sort of, in some ways, reducing a little bit the, the sort of arena, but keeping, if, as far as I could, keeping that sort of multiplicity of programming and scholarship. And, and so it, it was very exciting for me to, if I may, to say that I really opened up the exhibition program at the Frick. So you become, through this uh, arc, you, you start off as a scholar with a scholarly brief in your head. You then get excited by the idea of museums, and particularly I, uh, museums in North America, which is, which is so interesting. You focus not only on your scholarly work as a curator, but you also become an educator you also become a presenter and somebody who is focused on public programming. You're beginning to uh, negotiate in a, in a real business sense for the exchange of works. You're beginning to acquire uh, so many of the business skills that are important to subsequent success. And then you come to the Frick and now you are, um, you are, your brief is to create from this jewel an exhibition schedule that attracts attendance, that attracts attention, that is going to thrive in the shadow of uh, one of the most intimidating museum president, uh, presence in the world, the Metropolitan. How was that when you, when you come in and you found what you found and you start your journey? Well, at the Frick, I must say, I was lucky in my timing because many of the, some of, well, some of the staff were already reaching retirement and there were positions to fill. And so I was able to hire from the Getty, a brilliant curator who could work on... And you really shaped the curatorial oh, yes. staff I, I, at, I, I'm at, very, at institution. I, I believe, I'm very proud of that. I mean, I didn't, in, in one case, the senior curator had been there before me, and she is a wonderful scholar and a wonderful person, and she's just been able to do more and more. But we also were able to bring in um, the, the, this fine specialist and create a program of young scholars, fellows, that we in, finally had endowed by the Mellon, to, to give us this sort of new generation, rolling generation of um, very promising young professionals who do small projects, even small for the Frick, with our assistants. And a new registrar who had been head of registration at MoMA, really excellent seasoned professionals who were excited about the challenge uh, of being small but beautiful, if you like. And, and the reputation of a museum internationally, that reputation for excellence for its staff, for the care mm, mm. Uh, that, that people take with the art. That is what enables these museums to attract the great works for their exhibition programs. You're absolutely right. And there, I must say, that was the Frick. That was the Frick from the beginning. 
in a way. It had this excellence, this reputation for seriousness, scholarship, stewardship. And you had that to build on. And what I think was, what I could bring was a sense that we could be more ambitious in what we were looking to do and that we could at certain times play, as it were, in the big leagues with the Louvre, with Orsay, with San Francisco. You're in this similar situation of taking the curatorial reputation and unfolding that, taking people who are very talented and making sure that they are appropriately exposed uh, to the world, taking these collections and drawing more attention, deserved attention uh, to those collections, bringing new collections here and combining those works with works from the institution and telling a new story. You know, it's a foundation of excellence on which to build. And that, uh, I've always uh, recognized the collections at the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco um, as being tr wonderful and not knowing them as well as I might, but also not, not seeing them as perhaps pushed forward as much. What type of interpretive philosophy uh, do, you, um, do you favor or do you see the museum as a way to explore different interpretive philosophies and, and the ideas of, of um, your curators and the artists that they are presenting? I don't want to get bound up with one approach. I want to go back to a very a sort of fundamental obligation of the museum, which is to conserve, to show, to communicate, to educate. You know, museums were places, places of both enlightenment and enjoyment, and both of those are important. So there's an entertainment uh, uh, piece no, of this. No question. There is aesthetic pleasure is, ent is enjoyable. And the, that aesthetic response, putting aside from it all, all the interesting uh, material and information and interpretation, the aesthetic response, a visceral, uh, physiological response, is very precious. And if you can create that and give, offer that to people, it's a wonderful thing, and that's what museums do and should do, and I think the fine arts museums do it very well. Well, Colin Bailey, thank you so much for exploring the art, uh, your career, these institutions, and the fine arts museums of San Francisco with us today, and thank you so much for your insights. Thank you, Mark. It was great. <laughs>